But you've written a couple of books. Now, your first book was published by McGraw-Hill. That's right. What, what was that one about? Well, it actually took some of the things that we were doing in the classroom. In the classroom, I learned very quickly that having a textbook was one of the most boring things you could ever do for entrepreneurship. Yep. So instead, we came in and every day, we would work on starting a business. So every semester, we started a real business with real money. And I would come in and say, here's what we did today. Here's what we did next week. Here's what I'm going to do to start marketing. And we did that 12 semesters in a row, every time we actually had a profitable business by the end of the semester. And so that became kind of a little media celebrity thing. Yeah. It became kind of interesting and some of the Atlanta uh, press started talking about it. And one of the uh, reporters said, you should really write a book, call McGraw-Hill and see if they're interested. And I was like, I don't have time to write a book. I don't <laughs> want to do that. You call. And the reporter called back a week later and said, you have a contract with McGraw-Hill. You have five weeks to write a book. And so we sit down and we did it. We wrote a book that says entrepreneurship doesn't have to be about creativity, risk, or passion. We can go out there and be entrepreneurs without taking all that risk. You know, we don't have to start with $200,000. We don't have to go raise $2 million. Lots of great businesses start with $1,000, you know, $2,000. And that reduces risk. And you can still have your mortgage, still keep your kids in college, and maybe have the money to do some things that you're excited to do. Also, creativity. You know, I'm not a big fan of creativity. I love it when businesses are creative, but we have Adidas and Nike, Hilton and Hyatt, McDonald's and Burger King. There's nothing wrong with taking a business that's already out there, putting your twist on it and doing it yourself. So don't sit on the sidelines simply because you're not creative. Yeah. We want you to go out and get active. Yeah, so many people think I've got to come up with this one idea that nobody else has ever thought of. Right. That doesn't happen in real life, does it? Well, you know, maybe uh, Facebook people do that, but I'm not that creative. I'm not qualified yeah. to do that. So I just look around and see, I look for a problem, you know, and that's what I believe entrepreneurship is about, solving a problem. And if I can find a problem, you know, people will pay me to make their problems go away. Yeah. And so we look at it that way. We try to think of, instead of entrepreneurship being about risk and creativity, that slows you down. Think of it as solving someone's problems, and then it's very, very easy. Risk, Creativity, and that's your first book. Right. McGraw-Hill. Now you got a new book coming out. Right. Rock Stars and, in an Elevator. Now, let's do it again. Rock Stars that's in right. an Elevator. That's Tell right. me about that. Well, we take 14 famous songs, songs that most of us have heard of, some oldies, some newies, you know, mix them up and use those songs to create perfect elevator pitches or value propositions for small business people and entrepreneurs. So, you know, one of the hardest things we have is being able to express in 18 seconds why I'm cool. You only have 18 seconds. <laughs> and after that, you're on the 33rd floor and you're gonna get out of the elevator, right? <laughs> so I've got just a very few seconds to make you remember who I am. Yeah. And even more importantly, to have a question. You know, the perfect value proposition creates something in the other person's mind. Well, tell me more about that. That was really cool what you said. I don't know 100% about you, but I want to know more. That's a great value proposition. And that's what we're trying to do with these rock stars. Well, we start off with what we consider the greatest entrepreneurial songwriter of all time. And of course, no one will ever guess who this is. I wouldn't. No, it's Vanilla Ice. Do you remember Vanilla Ice from the 80s? Ice, Ice, Baby. Ice, Ice Baby. He was a, a white rapper. He had one huge song, but he was a big rap yeah. star in, in the 80s. And he's still doing some stuff out Vanilla there. Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice, right. Uh, he has a, a great song, and the song goes, Yo, baby, if you got a problem, I will solve it. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Not, I will study it, not, I'll form a committee and will think about it. Yo, I'll solve it. If you got a problem, I will solve it. I think that's the epitome of entrepreneurship. That's it. That's it. So if you can take that and figure out what problem you're solving for your customer and explain that in 18 seconds and say, I'm the guy that makes that problem disappear. That's a great value proposition. So for a technology company, don't you hate it when you lose all of your data? I'm the guy that makes that problem disappear. Yeah. That's all you have to say. I now know what you do. I know that you can relate to me because you understand my problem. And when we connect on that basis, I'll remember what you do for a business. It's unique now. You've gone to these rocks, so give me some more. All right, John Lennon. You know John Lennon, of course. I know John Lennon, All right, of Imagine, one of the famous songs, Imagine a Perfect World. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Well, we 
can use that to create value propositions as well. And as a matter of fact, your alma mater, UGA, won the national championship a couple of years ago in elevator pitches using an Imagine pitch. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it wasn't in the media. I don't know if uh, ESPN I didn't know covered that. it very yeah. well. But uh, think about this. There was a company and they had a ball bearing that made snowboards and skateboards do more twists and half yeah. pikes. And I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, I'm not a skateboarder and I know less about ball bearings. So describing that company is really hard. But here's the pitch they came up with. And it's an imagine pitch. Imagine you're driving a car with no power steering. And all of a sudden that car has power steering. That's what we do for skateboards and snowboards. That, that does it for I me. get it. I yeah, now I understand. It. Yeah. You know, I don't really know what you do, but I yeah. understand power steering. And so, wow, you make the skateboard go really fast. I get it. That's simple. And so we take a very complicated idea and imagine the scenario that it creates, and that's the perfect value proposition. But, all right, Jim, give me song number three. All right, another UGA reference here, REM. Yeah. REM, I believe. This is a value proposition that we would use when you want to say something maybe a little controversial. Maybe you want to say something like, I can change an industry. It takes a lot of chutzpah to come off and say, I can change an industry. Say. However, if you couch it a little more politely, I believe in a future, blah, blah, blah. You can say something really profound if you simply back it up with, I believe, or it seems to me like. Yeah. And you can do something like that that's very profound. like. I believe I can create a social media where a billion people will sign on and share the most secret, intimate yeah. details of their life. I believe we can create a network like yeah. that. That would be a good value proposition for Facebook five or six years ago. Yeah. Because they're describing something that maybe we don't all 100% yeah. buy into, but I'm trying to convince you that we can. So REM, I believe. And REM is based in, in Athens, Georgia. Athens, Georgia. Huge, Georgia Bulldog. A huge UGA all right. group. All right, four. Sinatra, New York, New York. Yeah. If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. If you can make it there, you can, can make, make it, it anywhere. anywhere. Exactly. So we use this value proposition when you have one incredible customer, when you have one thing about you that sets you apart and you don't need to say anything after that. So I'm a caterer at the White House. Stop. Don't say anything I else said. after that. I'm a caterer for the White House. Oh, and I do all of the Tarkington functions too. No, <laughs> just stop. stop. That, let's go Kanye West. New artist, right? Okay. Certainly the biggest uh, ego in the world, right? Gold digger. But gold digger is when someone says, you know, I don't really believe that. We'll say, well, Wells Fargo just bought it. Coca-Cola just paid me for that. In other words, establishing the fact yeah. that the rest of the marketplace has validated my product. So when you get a huge sale, a huge validation, make that your uh, value proposition. Yeah. We have another Kanye West. His ego is so big we gave him two songs, <laughs> right? And the second song would be Stronger. That, 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 that don't kill me, can only make me stronger. That which does not kill me makes me stronger, yeah. right? So I just lost one of my biggest accounts. And let me tell you why. The fact that I just lost my biggest account makes it so I will be the best servant you've ever had. The fact that I just lost my million dollar account makes me hungry and makes me going to serve you so, so well. So we use this situation whenever we have anything bad to talk about in yeah. our company. All right, your last song. Well, we use number seven when we've got nothing else to say, right? <laughs> and so we call this the KISS strategy. Remember the Kiss band, yes. you know, Gene Simmons? Yeah. Not a good band, no good songs, right? But they were still world famous. They have Kiss caskets, for goodness sakes, right? <laughs> uh, put a lot of makeup on it, scream really loud, put some pyrotechnics in your PowerPoint presentation. We use Kiss when we have nothing else to say. In other <laughs> words, we're just going to put a lot of makeup on it and scream really loud because that's all we've got.